person's mental illness. There's a lot more. Um, Sasha, thank you so much for being here and uh, for taking this on. And uh, of course, please welcome back Terry McMahon. Hey. <coughs> so Terry and I have been talking outside. Full disclosure, I, I watched this film two nights ago with a couple of my friends in our apartment, and so I know, I know the place that you all are at right now. I mean, at least I have a sense, you know, like we were, we, we were sitting there on the couch, like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna say a few words just to, just to give a, a small frame to this discussion that we're gonna have. So, um, so I'm someone who has spent a bunch of time uh, locked up in psychiatric hospitals, and and so that gives me a particular like when I when I see this film, there's ways that it resonates with me deeply, and um, in the community. So my friends and I, a bunch of years ago, we started this this thing called the Icarus Project, and it was basically an attempt to try and change the conversation around mental health and mental illness. We were basically saying. Um, there's a narrative out there that um, mental illness is a brain disease, you know, and we have, we have some other ideas about it. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to have conversations with a bunch of people about this, but it can get very, um, get very tricky. So this is how I'm going to frame our, our time together. We had some m agreements about how we talk to each other. First it was online, and then it was like in groups. We said... Um, if, you, if you use diagnostic categories to talk about yourself or you think all the categories are bullshit, you're welcome to be a part of our community. And if you take psychiatric drugs or you think the drugs are poison, you're welcome to be a part of our community. And we can extend that. You know, we can talk about electroshock therapy. If you think that electroshock therapy is something that, like, is just evil and no one should ever get it, um, or you, you know, you know people who it's been helpful for, um, you're welcome. And so, what I'm going to, like, before I, before I turn it over, like, here's my question. So, in this film, we have, we have um, this relationship. So, there's... There's a relationship, you know, between two strangers. But behind that, there's this, like, there's this relationship between a mother and a son. And in, the, and in the film, we get the sense that the son's diagnosed with a mental illness, but the, the mom's, you know, obviously struggling, obviously struggling too. Now, what I'm wondering is, are you trying to say with this film that it's that that um that the mom you know that, the, that it's like the mom's fault <laughs> that it's like that it's her is that it's her issue like what like what like what like are are you trying to say that mental illness doesn't exist <laughs> these are the questions that I get so uh, I think the first issue is we cannot engage in the conversation about reductionist diagnosis for mental illness and then at the same time engage in the reductionist notion of appropriating blame. So no, not only am I not saying the mother is not responsible, there are many th aspects of the film that should be raising questions rather than demanding answers from the narrative. But we talked about this the other day, to be a parent to be, look at this beautiful dog here, it's the same as being a parent. <laughs> to be a parent, to, to take responsibility for the life of another sentient being on every level is the most difficult thing anybody will ever do. We have a whole society structured around it that tells us a whole series of ways to be. And one of the ways we are told to be from the outset is just like training a beautiful dog, you're told there are certain ways of behavior that will allow the modification of another's behavior that is beneficial to them. So we start off discussing things like fairies or Santa Claus. Actually, what the, what's the Jewish equivalent of Santa Claus? There is not one. You've been robbed. 
<laughs> Maybe not, precisely. But just the, the idea of, when we, when we teach moral tales to a child, when we teach any, anything from any book, whatever book that may be, religion or otherwise, we teach them moral fantasies in order for them to comprehend in the initial stages what is required to be a decent person. As parents, we believe we are doing this for the right reasons. Then we extrapolate that further, and we go from fairies or magical beings to this thing we call God. And again, the idea of a God, the idea of something for which we have no quantifiable proof, but something we are willing to live or die by, and something we are willing to give a moral code to a child through, is for me the beginning of both madness and sanity the beginning of both reality and magic, the beginning of a relationship that is born out of both of you agreeing to a construct that is a fucking fallacy. Now, it doesn't mean there is no God, but it means that the construct that you've put in place, both of you have got to sign up to. Now, when the child deviates from that, they are punished appropriately because they are told the moral code that has been set in place has not been adhered to. When the child adheres to it, they are celebrated and protected and loved more. The punitive action is removed, the celebratory action is increased. Very quickly a child learns that to modify their behaviour in a way that receives supportive applause from the parent is something to be desired. But what happens when the child has something more complex and it's called a personality, and they want to explore from their own perspective a worldview that may not necessarily subscribe to the reductionist worldview that you've given them. That's the thing we're exploring in the film. If that thing is called love, if it's called intimacy, if it's called sexuality, if it's called anarchy, it doesn't matter. It's about the idea of believing that what you're doing is right. The mother is not malicious. She believes everything she's doing is right. She's behaving entirely out of love the consequence of which can be profoundly damaging. Powerful. So, so, so like, okay, so you're, what I'm left with, I mean, what I'm, I imagine, it's, 20, it's 2016, this film came out a couple years ago. In between the time that it came out and now, you've had the opportunity to show it. There's been a ton of people who've seen it what's the kind of response that you've been getting like what like how are people how are people engaging with this film? ask ask these people here yeah does anybody have anything to say i do i covered my eyes with electrical shock situations i had a girl up with that my grandmother may she rest in peace who was who had a lot of relatives that were killed in the holocaust was in and out of mental institutions had shock treatments I can't tell you how many times I mean just I couldn't even watch it because I never knew I mean I heard about what you would go through so for me seeing those scenes in a medical facility was real because I had to grow up, grow up with that my whole entire life Hi. Certainly a very thoughtful film. And um, what I think it really exposed very well was the injustice that anybody who has any sort of history of mental illness is immediately discounted. That every psychiatrist in this facility, everyone dealing with this fellow, already said, wrote him off and simply said whatever he's saying, it can't possibly be true. That is still endemic today. That even the best mental health facility, uh, the best rather mental health providers have some element of, um, you know, patronizing, you know, I know better. After all, look, you have a diagnosis. So I think unfortunately that syndrome still exists. Again, we were discussing this outside, but the idea of who decides the benefit of reductionist language and reductionist behavior is something that we don't question. You have an on ongoing election fiasco unfolding in this country now that is more extreme than any psychiatric institution in the country. 
<laughs> and it's called fucking politics. And we, for some reason, accept it. The buffoon cartoonery and extremity of some guy with a surname Trump. <laughs> the absurd lie and fallacy of a woman called Clinton. And watching those two combine in this gladiatorial nonsense. And then we have somebody called Sanders, who literally could be the beginning of a profound change. And what do we do? We do it to ourselves. We queue up collectively and use a democratic process to justify the beating of our own faces against the wall. <laughs> and we call it a democratic process. So not only is it in institutions, it's spread everywhere. We do untold damage to ourselves by utilizing belief systems that justify the prejudice and the removal of rights of other people every fucking day. And the thing that we do it most then, domestic love. I've never seen a more bloody battlefield than a marriage. <laughs> That's my father over there. <laughs> Um, what I found really uh, beautiful about the film is that um, I think that art can be uh, both um, a great thing in our society and an, a tremendously damaging thing. Um, and when I was watching it and I saw, and they, start, uh, and they first mentioned that he had schizophrenia and he was having this relationship, immediately in my mind, even as a disabled American, um, I immediately went to, oh, he's going to harm this girl. And he's going to do something to her, you know. Um, and that's something, you know, that I feel like I've been taught subconsciously. Sorry, I'm still a little shaken up by the film. It's hard to talk. <laughs> um, it feels like something I've been taught subconsciously. And um, and I think that I just appreciate so much what you brought to it. Um, his his disability was not his hamartia. It wasn't his tragic downfall. It was something beautiful. And you allowed that to come through in the film. I really appreciate it. It's very kind of you, thank you. But again, one, one of the things, you talk about art being dangerous. What's the great phrase you used outside? Dangerous gifts. Yeah. Dangerous gifts. Yeah. We were talking outside about the idea of, there are some people, for example, who believe that schizophrenia is a, a, a very sincere and real diagnosis that needs to be treated through vast amounts of therapy and, but more importantly, drugs. Now, the pharmaceutical industry doesn't give a fuck about anybody except having them on drugs from the cradle to the grave. That's their absolute bottom line aspiration, to get us all on drugs from the cradle to the grave and paying for it. But beyond that, there are magnificently noble therapists and psychotherapists and psychiatrists who really fundamentally believe that what they're doing is the right thing. But they are buying into a construct that is more important to protect than to interrogate. And we are all guilty of this, because it's so difficult in life just to be ordinary, just to wake up in the morning not feeling such fucking self-loathing that you want to throw yourself out the window, or feeling that people are not judging you on every level, that to just be ordinary where you feel capable of simply liking yourself, and liking yourself for 10 minutes in a non-prejudiced, non-judgmental way, where you begin the day going, you know what, I'm not a fucking asshole, I'm not a piece of shit, I'm actually a decent sentient human being who cares about other people. That alone is something that is against psychiatry on every level, because the moment you're thinking in that context, you already have a problem. Do you understand me? So the idea of you having this beautiful emotional response to the film, it's interesting that your first response is to blame yourself for your own prejudice. Your first response is to find the fault in you, as opposed to go, I just had a profound emotional response to something that I don't fully intellectually assimilate yet. But maybe the reason I don't is because somebody else is controlling the very aspects of me that are the best part of me. Now, when you say you're, you're somebody who's disabled, what do you mean by that? I'm a double-leg amputee. You're a double-leg amputee. Now, what's the difference between being a double-leg amputee and being somebody who cuts their entire body off from the neck down because they've been conditioned to do so? And the difference being that they don't feel anything anymore and they believe they are right and they believe that you are somehow the weak one and they're there to protect you from yourself. Hey, I would, I would just add that the, I feel like that, that impulse to, to blame ourselves to just to, and to, to think that we're the issue, that we're the problem, it's, um, 
it's based on you know the society that we're living in. We've gone through one thing when, when I was trying to figure out how to make sense of my relationship to to mental illness and my diagnosis. You know, I looked back and realized that really there was a shift that happened in the 1980s. There was this rise of what you know what a lot of people call like neoliberal economics, like the way the the idea that really everything is about the individual. You know, that once upon a time, not that long ago, there were there were social safety nets and there were there were you know, ways of, of thinking about collective structures and that more and more as a society we're we're broken up into these individual pieces and we've we've lost connection to where we come from. And when we start the 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 whole idea that we have these mental illnesses, you know, that you know that I'm I, there's something inherently wrong in me, you know, um, it's it's coming from the outside, and and if we can let go of that stuff, it's incredibly uh, transformative. I mean, and that, and really, so much of what makes us crazy, so much of what makes us sick, has to do with oppression, it has to do with poverty, it has to do with the fear of losing our jobs and the fear of the environmental catastrophes that are coming and like all of those pieces and it, rather than holding that inside but externalizing it, I feel like that's one of the powers of this film is that it leaves me with this sense of like, oh yeah, it like shatters this, this myth that here, you know, here's this biologically sick person and it puts it in a, a larger context. But also, can I just say, and I, because I would take that a step further, I'd agree totally, but go beyond it. It's important that we understand that to be diagnosed in a reductionist context somehow very often becomes beneficial to the person who's diagnosed because it allows them to negate responsibility. It allows you to become a victim, a professional victim. It allows you to, ha to go, I don't have to have the courage to crawl out of bed this morning in all my vulnerable, shy state and reach for love. What well, I'm suggesting the idea is that recognizing that the world is bigger than you, recognizing that the world is bigger than your fear, your doubts, your disability, whatever the hell that word means, recognizing that other people have magic and power and alchemy in them that if you reach out and touch them can become progressively, gorgeously infectious to everybody is exactly the antithesis of a psychiatric overview which is about the reductionist individual notion of you are this thing that is compartmentalized and now we can forget about you and move on to the next one. So I'm not suggesting for a moment it's about the negation of responsibility, it's in fact about the opposite. To have the courage to reach out and no matter how terrified you are, connect with one other person. That's the beginning of the profound alteration. And I'm going to add on to that. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Man. No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to add on to that and just say there's a lot of people, myself included, who we need our diagnoses to be able to get the services that we get in the world. And so it's not a question of just like throwing away our system. It's about navigating it and knowing, okay, maybe you have this diagnosis of schizophrenia. Maybe you have this diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And like, that's fine to, to, to have that and ha have that language and to be able to speak it. And then deep down inside, you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's just a bunch of words, you know. Like, and and you you do what you got to do because that's the language that our society speaks. That's like, if you want to get services in this world, you need to be able to like navigate that stuff. Hi. Um, I guess for me, one of the, the themes of your movie, I guess to me, is um, kind of like the encapsulation of the, of the idea of madness for the last 200 years or so about the system at some place that has to encompass all of this. Um, that the idea that, I guess, people with serious mental illness have to kind of be dealt with, institutionalized, um, treated a certain way, that everyone involved in their care has to keep this narrative that, you know, that they're not, not really people, that they're not really we're worthy of going outside of that institution, you know, and this also concerns people with other certain disabilities, also who are kept in institutional settings or the elderly. Um, and the idea is that this person was trying to um, connect with the world, and the idea that he found love for a moment, and this broke all of these ideas that um, he was just this this thing, this object to be dealt with. All of a sudden, he was a human being, and then everyone had to deal with that, and they had to, you know, figure out how to counteract that and try to make it not go away and they used the, uh, the, 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 I guess the complex of all the drugs and treatment to try and erase that from him and it didn't work 
And then they had realized that they couldn't just live live that old you know that old reality. His mother couldn't just be someone who was protecting him from the world. You know, just kind of kind of got me there, I guess. And it's beautifully summed up. And again, I, I think we need to understand that Patrick is the one who was diagnosed with a mental illness, but he's the only one who has the courage to try and find love. And with the exception of the doctor, every single character in the film, all of them believing that what they're doing is necessary and right, end up inadvertently having an emotional reaction that they would not have in life if they had not engaged with another human being whose heart was beating out of his chest. And we all, understandably, through fear and through compromise and through, again, our own form of self-imposed reductionism, we come up with qualifications again and again for fear. We rationalize fear. And again, the same thing that we talked about with the medical institution that now applies to democracy. Democracy was the most noble aspiration imaginable. The original notion of social responsibility for mental illness was a really beautiful, noble aspiration. But look how both of them have been bastardized beyond measure. And you tell me, is Donald Trump mentally ill or is he smart beyond measure? Hi, um, thank you. I thought this was incredible. It was like beyond moving, and especially since you wrote it in addition to directing it, I'd love to hear about your inspirations or, or like your sources for making something that's unimaginable to some people like myself who doesn't have a lot of experience with uh, the mentally ill or the institutions, um, but, but also completely relatable to probably all of us. It's very kind of you. Thank you. There's, there's two things that it came out of, because you were talking about your experiences earlier, but I, I worked as a trainee orderly in a psychiatric institution, and I used to see at the, week, at the weekends the parents or guardians would come and visit the patients. They were called residents, but it was just a bullshit word for patients. They were incarcerated. And the parents would come, and the guardians would come, and there would be kind of a first song over the weekend. It would be visiting time. And it was quite lovely. And there was genuine, sincere love in the room. But the moment any one of those patients or residents, male or female, regardless of gender, showed any aspiration toward intimacy, they were shut down as if their aspiration was part of their disease. And I was only a kid at the time, but I remember thinking, I don't quite understand how, but in some shape or form, I have to try and articulate that later. And then the second thing is, I was homeless as a teenager for about a year and a half. And when you're homeless, you become so far removed from the world, you become a ghost in your own life. And you don't know who you are anymore. And they talk about the prevalence of schizophrenia, for example, in homelessness. But I think the idea of that shift between your reality versus the surreality of what's outside you is the same principle that applies to being utterly removed from your own life to such a degree that you were walking around as a ghost in it. And I wanted to somehow try and combine the two in a narrative that made sense to somebody who might feel that similar pain and simply to say, despite all the construct of the narrative and all the stuff that goes into making a movie, just simply to fucking say you're not alone. Folks, this is an unbelievable conversation and really something that uh, could go on and on and uh, hopefully will go on, Um, but uh, in other settings. I want to thank you so much for bringing this film to us and bringing this conversation and taking it to the next level. Um, So thank you. Um, I want to thank you all for being a part of this conversation and also urge you to continue it and um, I hope you'll also join us tomorrow night. Is there a bar or somewhere close to here? Because genuinely, everybody come and let's talk some more. (laughs) <laughs> Amsterdam Ale House is right across the street. But it's, it's full. I just came from there. In the back room. Back room. <laughs> the back room. Back room and excellent beer well, connection. Well, just that I noticed selection. some people wanted to say some stuff. Please don't go home. Come over across the road and let's talk some more, okay? Thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you.